بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Today we're going to talk about a contentious topic yet again, the Khawarij. And um, this also is kind of a difficult subject. Um, it also is going to be a little bit of a longer lecture, so bear with me here, but it's incredibly important history to understand, especially as Muslims living in the West. And this is the 10th lecture in our series. This will be the last lecture on the history of the Rashidun Caliphs. The next lecture will be about refuting Orientalism and how we deal with Orientalism relate, related to the uh, four rightly guided caliphs, as well as just uh, Orientalism in, in general regarding Sirah or later Islamic history, all that kind of stuff. So I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are as well. Ahlan wa sahlan, assalamu alaikum ya tullab al So, there are three books here that I think are really important to uh, this lecture. So on the right hand side over here, we have uh, Umar al-Ashqar's uh, book, uh, the Islamic Creed series, which I had the pleasure of uh, buying when it was first translated into English, boy, over, over probably over 10 years ago now. Um, and got to read that when I was doing my bachelor's degree in Islamic studies. And I read every single volume, cover to cover. It's, uh, I highly would recommend it. It's, it's quite a well, uh, you know, pretty good overview of the Athari Creed, but it is still maybe upper beginner, lower intermediate type of book. There are definitely lots of other books out there that go more in depth than that one. Um, but uh, there is a section where, you know, uh, Dr. Umar al-Ashqar, student of Nasruddin al-Bani, he gives an overview of the difference between the Ahl al-Sunnah wa jamaah i.e. the creed of the Salaf al-Salih, and the creed or the Aqidah of the Khawarij. And then uh, Orientalists, they're always very uh, concerned with non-Sunni sects of Islam. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the way of thinking that was engendered during the Enlightenment period, where uh, precision and categorizing things in a very specialized and minute way was seen as a good thing. Um, so we will get to that in the next lecture, why that is. Also William Chittick, his, his book, Science of the Cosmos, Science of the Soul that I mentioned before in class, uh, details that, why that is quite, quite a lot. Um, and that's something I'll talk about in the next lecture. And if you take the Islamic history class that I'll be teaching in the fall, uh, that's just a general overview of all of Islamic history, um, after starting with Muawiyah, pretty much until uh, our contemporary time, I, I will have you read an article that's about that topic specifically. But so I say all that to say that Orientalists are quite obsessed with the different uh, Shi'i factions and Kharaji factions within uh, Islam, you might say. Um, so there's this uh, interesting book on Ibaldi jurisprudence and uh, Ibaldi uh, creed written by Valerie Hoffman and Professor Valerie Hoffman. I've had the pleasure to meet on multiple occasions at uh, academic conferences as well as just in Chicago because I went and did my master's at the University of Chicago and she taught at the University of Illinois Champaign. And so um, she also got, I believe, her PhD from the University of Chicago. So um, she would come to the university and do workshops and different things like that. 
so she's somebody I know personally and um, she's a nice very nice person and a very sincere person and um, she tried her very best to be objective in, in writing this book and she wrote this book as a way to help uh, Sunnis especially like Sunni uh, to understand who the modern Ibaldis are she wanted to make it accessible for religious scholars particularly and so yeah if you're able to consult any of these books like if you want to do a research paper related to the Khawarij or something like that um, you know I would recommend these books as sources it might be a little bit more difficult to get the Ibaldi jurisprudence book but maybe I could scan an article for you or something like that if that's what you decide you want to go and research So before I explain uh, the diagrams on this slide, I want to read a passage from The Essentials of Ibaldi Islam from Valerie Hoffman. And it'll help to elucidate some of the historical things that we've covered so far in this class. Because part of understanding history is understanding the different beliefs and perspectives of various groups that belong to that history and when we're talking about Sunni Islam when we're talking about the Salaf al Salih we also have to talk about who they were in conversation with who they were fighting who they were uh, refuting and and all of those types of things we have to understand the people being refuted and under to really understand the refutation being made and so I'm gonna read a passage here on the Ibaldi perspective of these historical events and remember that Ibaldis are a branch of the Khawarij they're the only surviving branch to this day they rule over the country of Oman and to begin the Ibadi perspective on the early caliphate differs from that of both Sunnis and Shia. From their point of view, the only legitimate way to come to power is not through familial or tribal affiliation or through divine selection, but through selection by the leading men of the Muslim community. The only way to maintain legitimate government is by ruling according to Islamic law, Sharia. Any infringement of those rules or any commission of a grave sin, fisk, or persistence in a minor sin makes one unfit to be a ruler of the Muslims and it is the Muslims' duty to remove such a person from power, i.e. khuruj. The Ibaldis believe that the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, were all selected on the basis of religious merit, not on tribal or familial affiliation. So they all came to power in a legitimate fashion. They see Abu Bakr and Omar as righteous rulers who committed no grave sins throughout their caliphates. They divide Uthman's 12-year rule into a six-year period of righteous rule and a six-year period of unrighteous rule. As Madelung notes, this perspective was very common amongst Uthman's critics, but the policies of nepotism and distribution of lands conquered by the Muslims were already in place in the early years of his caliphate. Uthman's tendency to appoint as governors of the provinces his own relatives, who were often capable but unprincipled leaders, and his allocation of the proceeds of the conquest to his kin were controversial among many pious Muslims of the time. Muslim soldiers stationed in Egypt and Iraq converged on Uthman's residence in Medina, demanding his repentance and a change in policy. Uthman promised to meet their demands and the soldiers dispersed. But soldiers returning to Egypt intercepted a letter allegedly written by Uthman to his governor in Egypt, 
ordering him to kill the rebels. The second siege of Earthman's home in Medina ended in his assassination. The assassination of Earthman immediately exposed conflicting points of view concerning the qualifications of a ruler. Some Muslims, especially members of Earthman's own clan, the Banu Umayyah, felt that Earthman's policies were justifiable interpretations of the Qur'an, and that he was not obligated to implement the policies of his predecessors Abu Bakr and Omar. From this perspective, his killing was an outrageous murder of a righteous Muslim who had been legitimately selected for leadership of the community. On the other hand, other Muslims felt that Uthman had failed to rule by Islamic laws that he had wrongly favored his own kinsmen, who included the former rulers of Mecca, who were the Prophet's main antagonists, and who embraced Islam very late in Muhammad's career, and persecuted those pious companions of the Prophet who had criticized his policies and those of his governor in Syria, his kinsmen Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, from their point of view, Uthman had committed grave sins, failed to repent, and clung to leadership despite, despite widespread discontent. He had abdicated his responsibility to the people and his right to rule, and his adamant refusal to step down necessitated the drastic action of assassination. For some Muslims, the group that came to be called the Khawarij singular Kharaji or Kharajite, commission of a grave sin and failure to repent nullifies faith. Such a person has apostatized from Islam and deserves execution. In short, Uthman's killing raised a host of contentious questions concerning the relationship between faith and works, the definition of a Muslim and an unbeliever, and the proper qualifications for a Muslim ruler. Ali ibn Abi Talib's election as fourth caliph was not a true shura consultation as mandated by Umar bin al-Khattab on his deathbed. It was, as Madalung describes it, irregular. Supported by the rebels from the provinces who had participated in Uthman's assassination and the Ansar disenfranchised by Abu Bakr and left the community deeply divided into three factions. Many prominent Muslims, including the Prophet's youngest wife, Aisha, blamed Ali for Uthman's death and the fact that Uthman's assassins remained unpunished among Ali's supporters strengthened the impression of complicity. After suppressing a revolt in Basra, Ali faced his most dangerous opposition led by Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, Uthman's cousin and governor in Syria. Adi's main base of support was in Kufa, a military garrison city in Iraq. Their two armies met at Sufin on the, on the right bank of the Euphrates River in what is today eastern Syria. The armies are said to have stayed there for 27 days, or sorry, 77 days, reluctant to shed blood in a conflict that split tribes and families. Before battle was joined in Safar 37 Hijri, July 657 Gregorian, in the course of the battle, as Ali's soldiers pressed hard against their opponents, Muawiyah's troops are said to have tied copies of the Qur'an to the end of their lances as a call to subject to arbitration the question of whether or not Earthman was justly killed. Despite his initial reluctance, Ali acquiesced to this request to the outrage of a significant segment of his followers who promptly abandoned him on the battlefield. These were known as the Muhakkimah because of their slogan, Judgment Hukum belongs to God alone. And as El Khawarij, those who go out, this last appellation is usually interpreted to mean those who left Adi's camp, but is interpreted differently by some Ibaldi writers. From the Kharajite point of view, 
Earth man, by virtue of his grave sins, was an apostate deserving of death. And Muawiyah and his followers, who claimed the right to avenge that death, were likewise guilty of apostasy. Adi's right to rule had been self-evident from his selection by the leading righteous men of the community and by his protection of Earthman's assassins. But now that he had agreed to subject the matter to human arbitration to negotiate with unbelievers, Adi himself had become an unbeliever. They felt compelled to withdraw from the society of unbelievers in a new emigration, Hijra, following the example of the Prophet's emigration from Mecca to Medina in order to build a just Muslim society. Anyone who did not join them and embrace their cause was considered an apostate deserving of death. That the Ibaldis, the Khawarij, deeply identify with much of this history is evident by the fact that they recognize as their first Imam Abdullah bin Wahb al-Rasibi, whom the Khawarij selected as Imam after their withdrawal from Ali's camp. Ibaldis use the term Wahhabi to refer to what they see as the purest version of Islam. The title of the theological primer translated in this book is Al-Aqidah Al-Wahhabiyyah, the Wahhabi Creed. The author of this primer, Masr bin Salim bin Udayyam al-Rawahi, was also a great poet known as Abu Muslim, who wrote a poem in praise of the courage and faith of the thousands of Kharajite soldiers, including Ibn Wahhab, who met their death in battle against Ali at Nahrawan on 9th Safar, 38 Hijri, 17th of July, 658. It's the poems known as al qasida Al-Nahrawaniya, a battle that in truth was a massacre that undermined the legitimacy of Ali's caliphate. Modern Ibaldi scholars have defended the Kharajite succession and the Kharajite verdicts on Uthman, Ali, and Muawiyah. According to the Algerian Ibaldi scholar Muhammad bin Yusuf Atfayish, the term Khawarij was originally praiseworthy, meaning those who go out khuruj, to struggle jihad in the way of God. But because of the negative connotations the term acquired, our companions do not call themselves by this name, but call themselves Ahl al istiqama the people of straightness, a reference to Surat al-Mustaqeen. And that's the end of the passage from Valerie Hoffman's book, which she wrote specifically for Muslim scholars of non kharaji sects to understand the history of the Khawarij. And this scan here of the page in front of you is from uh, the book on the previous slide, the Islamic Creed series by Omar al-Ashqar, who uh, he was also the author of the History of Islamic Law book that I showed you guys previously. And this is from the first uh, volume of the series, which is in English, Belief in Allah in Light of the Qur'an and Sunnah. In Arabic, it's called Al-Imanu Billahi. And he distinguishes how the Khawarij are different from the Ahl Sunnah, how they were different from the Salaf al-Salih. And it predominantly has to do with the concept of Fisq and Kufr. So if you see up here, Fisq does not equal Kufr according to Sunnis. Fisq equals Kufr according to the Khawarij. That's the main distinction uh, in a simplified form. Basically, Fisq or Fusulq, it refers to uh, major sins. And also when you remain in a minor sin continuously and unrepentantly that is also considered a fisk. 
So from a theological perspective, Sunnis would say that fisk is a major sin. It means your faith is not uh, complete. Your faith is lacking. That's the Athari view. Um, the Maturidi view is that actions do not uh, necessarily affect uh, faith or make your faith go up or down. So both of those uh, are accepted within uh, Sunni doctrine. But according to the Khawarij, if you do an act of fisk, it automatically makes you a disbeliever, a kafir. And you have to repent from that fisk and say your shahada once again. And this is what they demanded of Ali bin Abi Talib after he used his own ijtihad as a senior companion living during that time to arbitrate with Muawiyah. The Khawarid said, no, la hukum illa lillah. There is, you can only judge, you can only adjudicate by the Sharia. And therefore you're not following the Sharia when you're uh, having like these non-Muslims uh, be as, as arbitrators to do tahkim. And they then made takfir or excommunication, labeling as a disbeliever of Ali, upon Ali bin Ali Talib, radiallahu anhu. And this has a lot of implications for our current time now, because there are people nowadays who claim to be Sunni, who claim to be following the Salaf al Salih. And they will make takfir on someone because they are not ruling according to Sharia. If you're a dictator over a Muslim country and you're not ruling according to Sharia, that is fisk. No doubt, that is fisk. But that does not, that does not, that does not make them a kafir. And that does not make their blood halal. That does not allow a Muslim to take their life unjustly like that. But unfortunately, like I've said, we've seen people who claim to follow the Salaf, who claim to be Sunni, who are using the rhetoric that if you don't rule by Sharia, you're a Kafir, you're in Jahiliya. And this is the hallmark, the staple, the main distinction of Kharaji creed, Kharaji theology, the Aqidah of the Khawarij. And this is a very important topic, and that's why I'm talking about it, right? Because all too often, there are people out there who copy the Khawarij without even realizing it. And so, for instance, the example that's used here by Umar al-Ashqar is ribba, or lying, consuming the property of orphans. All of this is fusuq, it's fisq. But that person is still considered a Muslim according to Sunnis, even though they're just maybe not a good Muslim, perhaps. Right, And then in this smaller box here, denying the creator, disbelieving in the angels, books, messengers, last day, six pillars of Iman, that is kufr. Worshipping anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or like praying to Nabi Isa, thinking Isa is Allah, like some of the Trinitarian Christians do, that is kufr. A'udhu uh, billahi min dhaka. And so this is an important uh, graph and an important distinction. And if you want more information on this, you can take a look at Umar al-Ashqar's book where he goes into detail with all the dala'il or adilla, the different proofs, um, delils about uh, this topic here, the different ahadith 
and ayat from Quran regarding this. And there's one of them right here from Sahih Muslim. And then this diagram over here talks about the origins of the Khawarij. So a lot of them, they were Quran reciters, Qurra, and they were part of the group that rioted or protested outside of Earthman's palace. They remained with Ali bin Abi Talib and went with him to Basra for the Battle of the Camel. They went with him to Safin um, to fight Muawiyah. And then when uh, Muawiyah called for arbitration, they uh, then left Ali's army when Ali agreed and they were known as Al Muhakkima. Al Muhakkima, because they wanted uh, Tahkim only by the Book of Allah, meaning that Ali should have ignored Muawiyah's request. Some of them uh, broke into the Najdiya, that's because they, they went to Najd. Some of them went to Sufriya branch, which uh, went to North Africa. Some of them went to Ibaldi. Ibaldis, they, uh, and the Nukaris, um, they were in Iraq, they were in uh, the mountains of Persia, uh, they went to Oman, and um, like the province of Ahsa in uh, eastern Saudi Arabia, as well as place North Africa like Libya and Algeria among the Kutaba Berbers and different things like that, and then um, the Azraqis were known as the most extreme of all of the Khawarij. They were the most murderous and um, the most violent and the most scary uh, during their time. And these different groups would uh, lead rebellions against the Umayyad dynasty and a little bit with the Abbasids, but mainly against the Umayyad dynasty. And it was actually Marwan's son, uh, um, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, who was able to kind of subdue them a little bit. Um, and then eventually all the other branches except Ibaldi um, more or less fizzled out. So Ibaldi is the only one that still exists today. And like I said, they're in charge of Oman and they still are in North Africa. They have like yearly conferences, scholarly conferences of all different kinds that Orientalists attend and study them. Um, they're considered a curiosity by Western Orientalists because they are so different. And uh, all of these different branches of the Khawarij, they all agreed that Ali should not have made arbitration with Muawiyah. And they don't really agree on, on a whole lot else. They have uh, different ideas amongst themselves. Um, And the Nukaris broke away from the Ibaldis kind of briefly on like some fine points of theology, but then realized it was just semantics and they kind of like came back as one group, I guess. And um, like I said, the other groups just did not survive until the modern day. So that in a very concise, small summary or in a nutshell, as they say, is who the Khawarij were historically and what their kind of beliefs were. And this is necessary knowledge to understand why they behaved the way they did towards Ali bin Abi Talib, which we will get to. So this is the Battle of Nahrawan, or as they would say with the Persian pronunciation, Nahrawan. And uh, it was, I mean, even calling it a battle, a ma'arika, or, you know, like a harb, it's uh, a bit too strong of a word, in my opinion, because it was basically just a massacre. Um, the Khawarij were small in number. Um, they weren't properly outfitted as a military. They were kind of like a group of vagabond rogues, or you might say outlaws. Um, rebels, you know, whatever type of word you want to use. They weren't like a, a, they were, you know, you might barely call them a militia, but they weren't even that organized, it seems like. Um, they were just a group of religious fanatics, you might say, um, who 
got slaughtered by a professional army, if you will. Um, so as we know, the Kharijites denounced Ali as caliph. They declared Ali radiallahu anhu and his followers, as well as the followers, you know, the Shia Muawiyah as kufar, disbelievers. And they elected Abdullah bin Wahab al-Rasabi as their caliph. And uh, the book that Valerie Hoffman translated is called Al-Aqidah Al-Wahhabiyya. So they still, you know, the Ibaldis that exist today still revere this figure. And uh, these Khawarij, they settled, they decided to go and uh, make their settlement in Nahrawan. Nahrawan, if you remember from the map, in the last uh, lecture is in northern uh, Mesopotamia or uh, northern Iraq kind of getting closer to uh, Kurdistan and it was kind of outside the purview of the Islamic Empire in the sense that there wasn't really a lot of uh, there wasn't like a military garrison town there um, there wasn't uh, military presence or caliphal presence there really um, it was kind of like a backwaters area so to say it was a valley so actually on the slide here uh, I made it faded so that you could you know read the words better but if you look this picture here in the background is the valley of Nahrawan and so on each side you have kind of like these hills or mountains if you will and in the middle, there's this valley. And the word uh, Nahr means river in Arabic, right? Nahr. So uh, this probably was uh, one of those types of riverbeds that like when there was a torrential rain once a year, whatever would happen in the desert, this would fill with water. And perhaps that at one time, it was a 24-7 ongoing river that maybe due to some sort of climate change dried up but this is what it looks like this is where they fought the battle so on each side there was kind of like hills or mountains so they had to face each other head on and without being able to really flank each other from the sides except maybe with archers and so that's what the area looked like and uh, you can go and uh, google that and see the picture for itself this picture was taken in 1909 i believe something like that and so, um, you know, with the Battle of Sulfin, they decided to do arbitration or tahkim. Uh, but these kind of like arbitrations or negotiations uh, didn't go anywhere. And I mean, that's kind of to be expected. They didn't go anywhere. And they knew that war was yet again going to be inevitable. And Ali had asked these people, these who had left his army, these Khawarij, to come back and join him because he wanted to march towards Syria, but they refused and they would not join Ali's army unless he acknowledged that he had disbelieved and would repent. Because um, they considered Ali to be a non-believer. And this was their extremism that took them out of Sunni Islam. And before Ali could face Muawiyah, his advisors recommended that he first go and, and defeat these Khawarij rebels who were, you know, like I mentioned, militarily weak. Um, unless, you know, they grew like recruits or rebels or converts or whatever you want to say. Um, and you know became more of a threat and Ali at first uh, wanted to completely ignore them because they just seemed like these rebels who were kind of like rambunctious and they were kind of away from all the main cities and happenings and they didn't really seem to be causing that many problems like halas leave them alone but then they started killing innocent uh, bystanders, 
and even Sahaba like Abdullah bin Khabab al Arat. I remember Khabab, he was from Al Mustad'afin. He was uh, one of the early you know, converts to Islam and was highly tortured. Um, because of his Islam, they used to lay him down on a bed of hot coals and press their foot upon his chest so that his back would be pressed into the hot coals and they burnt all of the skin off of his back. His, his entire back was like a giant series, maybe one big, huge keloid scar. Um, so Khabab had endured a lot and that his, was his son, Abdullah. And so what the Khawarij would do if they came across somebody new or someone in their territory is they would question them. What do you think about Abu Bakr? Oh yeah, Abu, Abu Bakr, he's one of the you know, righteous caliphs. Oh, well, what do you think about Omar? Yeah, Omar, he's, you know, good guy. Oh, what do you think about Uthman? Yeah, Uthman was a pious caliph, and they go, Kafir, and they would kill the person. Or they sometimes they would ask him also about Ali and Muawiyah and different stuff. Um, then they would make tafkir and, and uh, kill that person, or takfir, sorry, excuse me, takfir. And they would kill that person. They would excommunicate that person and kill them if they would not repent on the spot. So they were very extreme. And amongst them, it's estimated, and like I said, you know, Ibn Khaldun actually said that all numbers you take with a grain of salt. But amongst them, they had uh, 2,800 2, fighters, and Ali had 15,000. 200 fighters originally the Kharajites had more people but um, uh, 1200 of them had actually defected when Ali showed up they repented and joined joined Ali's army pretty much instantly um, so they fought against their former Kharajite brethren and it was a massacre. They stood no chance. Ali's army was a professional army. It had a cavalry. It had archers. It had people who had uh, better armor and better weapons. It was better funded. And so 2,400 Kharajites were killed. Some narrations say that 400 of them are said to have been uh, severely wounded but survived. Some narrations say that there were only nine survivors from the Khawarij's side. And Ali, I think some reports say that he lost maybe only a few fighters or like 100 or 50, you know, always some like very small number. Um, so for the most part, it was just a slaughter, a massacre. Um, Maybe in our politically correct times nowadays, they would have called this a genocide. Um, but they saw it as suppressing a rebellion, suppressing a people who were being violent and murdering others. And, um, you know, because they went to the Khawarij and, they, they, you know, Ali's army said, turn over those who have murdered so that, uh, they may be punished and they refused to do so and the battle ensued and the Kharajites themselves who the survivors and the later converts remembered fondly the veterans of Nahrawan who later became like their religious or political leaders um, they had a very fond remembrance of them and so that's basically the Battle of Nahrawan. Uh, Ali didn't really want to do it, but eventually was kind of his hand was forced and he went and dealt with them. But really he wanted to march to um, Syria to deal, deal with Muawiyah. After this battle though, his army needed to be resupplied. The soldiers were tired. They needed time. Uh, to recuperate before they could go and have this huge battle with Muawiyah that was another professionally trained uh, serious army they'd have to deal with so they had to return to Kufa in order to resupply essentially 
and uh, when they returned uh, to Kufa to resupply, Ali Karamallahu Wajhahu was assassinated. And so some of these surviving uh, Kharajites, they plotted to assassinate all the various Muslim leaders and governors. Um, so they had this uh, coordinated assassination attempt where on the same day they were wanting to assassinate all of the, I guess you'd say Sunni leadership, all the people who were not Khawarij. Um, so they want, wanted to do an assassination attempt on Ali, on Muawiyah, on Amr bin al-As, as well as other various like governors of the garrison towns and cities and things like that. And um, Muawiyah, he was struck, I believe, in the head, um, but he did survive. Amr bin al-As, I think he was sick that day. And so he had like one of his uh, military commanders leading the Fajr prayer instead. And so that man was killed by the assassin. And Amr bin al as since he wasn't there, he survived. But Ali was fatally attacked during the Fajr prayer. And so the Kharaji's name was Abdurrahman bin Muljam. And even that name Muljam insinuates that probably this person wasn't Arab um, that their father this person Muljam probably was Persian or something else um, so it's kind of an insinuation that this person was a Maula that um, they didn't have serious knowledge about Islam which explains why they were deceived by the Khawarij. And this guy went to attack Ali during the Fajr prayer. He swung his sword and uh, the reports say that the first swing of the sword missed. Some say that he hit part of like the ceiling in the masjid. Some say that he hit the wall um, and the sword kind of got stuck and he had to pull it out. But then the second swing he hit Ali in the forehead, um, his frontal lobe or frontal cortex, um, and Ali survived for two days after that injury, but then succumbed to his injury. And Ali did not appoint a successor because the Sahaba were asking him, who do you want appointed after you? Do you want it to be Hassan? Do you want it to be Hussein? You know, maybe uh, his other son, Muhammad bin Hanafiya. And Ali, you know, basically told them, you know, I want you to choose after I pass. And so he didn't actually appoint uh, anyone in particular. And like I said, he was attacked in his frontal lobe. And some Orientalists might say something like, oh, well, how could he have survived for two days if he had a brain injury that doesn't make sense um, and I did I just did some basic uh, research on you know in brain injuries to the frontal lobe and because uh, I also had an uncle who he had an injury to his frontal lobe from a car accident and he seemed fine um, except you know it does give you uh, problems with like language impulsive behavior social uh, issues um, personality, behavior changes, that type of stuff. Um, but you, you do survive. And so probably what actually killed Ali was not the actual brain injury or in the damage to the brain, but was the blood loss because there's so much blood that goes to the brain that he probably bled out, which would explain how he survived for two days. Well, wallahu a'lam bil sawab. Um, and that's why he was also able to function and have conversations and these types of things. So in other words, the traditional um, story, it makes sense even from what modern Western science has to say. And here again, I don't really give a whole lot of credence to modern Western science. I think it's an epistemology that is heavily lacking and in contradiction to many uh, traditional Islamic ways of verifying truth. 
And um, so if any of you are in the STEM world, uh, please be patient with me and understand. Maybe we can have further conversations on that. It's not meant necessarily to denigrate Western science, but to put it on an equal playing field with other non-Western epistemologies. It is one way to access the truth and not the only way to access truth. It's important to understand. And uh, Muawiyah basically took over the Islamic empire as Amir al-Mu'mineen. He started calling, I mean, he was already calling himself Caliph, but he really uh, just mm, took over after Ali was assassinated. Um, now, if you take my next class in the fall, we'll get into um, how, you know, Hussein was killed at Karbala and those different types of things. But I honestly think it's it's kind of beyond the scope of this class, as well as Muawiyah's reign, because when Muawiyah takes over, it really uh, changes and uh, sets an entirely different tone and changes the trajectory of Islamic history uh, quite significantly. Um, the Umayyads um, took the leadership style of the Byzantines and took a lot of the culture from Hellenistic, uh, the Hellenistic culture. Um, so they were very uh, Greek influenced in their, even their art, their style of governing their style of, of politicking, um, and so on and so forth. And they fought, they, I mean, there was a lot of resistance that came uh, to the uh, Umayyads. It wasn't an easy ascension for them. You had Abdullah ibn Zubair, who uh, had his own uh, caliphate that he declared in rebellion to the Umayyads. You had constant... Uh, usurpations uh, happening, especially with the Kufans and Shi'at Ali, Ali, even after the death of Hassan and Hussein, or what's called as Hasnain, to refer to both of them. Um, and of course, we, we know that the Shi'a, and you'll, you'll read this in your Mujin Mu'min um, reading, that they believed in this succession of Imams, and uh, they often would cause trouble for the Umayyads, uh, especially the Ismailis, the Sevener Shia, uh, and their offshoot, the Qaramita, who are based in, even now to this day in the Arabian Peninsula, um, with kind of their de facto headquarters as Qutif, Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I used to tutor a lot of them in English, actually, which has a lot of uh, crazy stories I could tell you. I have a lot of crazy stories I could tell you about all of that. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, essentially the history of the Khulafa Rashidin from Abu Bakr to Ali. And we can tell that there, there was two distinct periods. Um, you know, the Khawarij uphold Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu anhumah. And they see them as the pious caliphs and then they see Uthman's and Ali's caliphates as not being pious in the end. In the beginning of their caliphates they accepted that they were rightly elected and behaving righteously. It wasn't until the second half of Uthman's reign that they really got fed up with him and that when Ali agreed to arbitration with Muawiyah at the Battle of Safin, that they declared him an apostate. And so we have kind of these two different phases. You have the first two caliphs that marks like the first phase of the Khulafa Rashidin, and then the last two caliphs where it's much more tumultuous, you might say, um, that that marks um, the second part of the Khulafa Rashidin. The first part is entirely, I guess you could say, like the main impetus or the main uh, theme of the first part is Islamic expansion. 
the, including Haruba Redda, the Red Wars, and um, the expansion into uh, Iraq, Iran, um, Khorasan, and into Sham, into Mosul, into uh, North Africa, Ifriqiya, as it's called in Arabic, to uh, Tairawan, and, and you know all these different places. Um, <clears throat> And then it, because when the Umayyads did take over, the expansion after that was a lot slower. They did eventually get to Spain. Um, they did kind of start to move up a little bit in Central Asia and, and, you know, more pushing into India. The next class, maybe we'll read Al Biruni, the Arab uh, traveler to Hindustan, who he kind of documented what he thought about the Hindus. Um, it's very interesting and <clears throat> excuse me like I mentioned before a lot of sub-saharan Africa West Africa um, uh, the Turkic steppes like Kazakhstan Tartarstan and these different places um, and much of uh, you could say India or Bang Bangladesh like South Southern Asia Southeastern Asia, like Indonesia, Malaysia, all these places were more latecomers to Islam with a lot of them not really converting in mass until about the 1500s. Um, and that's just a fact I think a lot of Muslims tend to forget. Um, and then also that the Arabs were a ruling minority over the Middle East. Um, for much of Islamic history, it wasn't really until the uh, Crusades and the Mongol invasion, those uh, two big calamities from, you know, one from the Western and the other one from the Eastern side of the Middle East, um, where they, uh, the people started converting in mass and started realizing, oh, you know, we've already absorbed so much of Islamic culture and we have so much affinity already for Muslims and Islam and Arabs that we might as well just convert because the Christians around the world are not even treating us like Christians. The Crusaders came and killed us thinking that we weren't even Christian. And then the Easterners didn't really give us any respect and slaughtered us just the same. So what's the point? And um, they knew that they would get a lot more privileges being Muslim in the Islamic empire. And so, you know, a, a good question to think about right now is what is the legacy of the Khulafa Rashidu and how does these four caliphs, how do they uh, have effects on the rest of Islamic history that last all the way up until the modern period? You know, how, do, how does this history affect the way we think about Islam right here and now? And what are lessons that we can learn from all of these events that can help us in the here and now and understand our life right now and how to be better Muslims right now. And with that, I will end the lecture. Allah give us beneficial knowledge and give us good in this life and the hereafter and protect us from the fire. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته